land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me in. When the Emperor Was Divine by Julia Tsuka. Chapter 2, titled Train, Part 1. The train moved slowly inland. Somewhere along the western edge of Upper Nevada, it passed a lone white house and a lawn and two tall cottonwood trees with a hammock between them, gently swaying in the breeze. A small dog lay sleeping on its side in the shade of the trees. A man in a straw hat was trimming hedges. The hedges were very round. They were perfect green spheres. Someone, maybe that man or maybe that man's that same man's gardener had planted flowers inside of a red wagon next to the mailbox. In front of a wooden picket fence was a victory garden and a hand-painted sign that read, For Sale. Beyond the house was the dry bed of a lake, and beyond the lake there was nothing but the scorched white earth of the desert stretching all the way to the edge of the horizon. On the map the lake was called Intermittent. Intermittent Lake because sometimes it was there and sometimes it wasn't. It all depended on the rain. I don't see it, said the girl. It was September of 1942 and her face was pressed up against the dusty window of the train. She was 11 and her hair was black and straight and tied back in a ponytail with an old pink ribbon. Her dress was pale yellow with a white, with white, excuse me, with wide puffy sleeves and a hem that was beginning to unravel. Pinned to her collar was an identification number, and around her throat she wore a faded silk scarf. Her shoes were Mary Jane's. They had not been polished since the spring. See what? asked her brother. He was eight years old, and his number was the same as the girl's. The girl did not answer. The lake had been dry for two years, but she did not know that. She had never seen the desert before, and although she had been uh, good, but She'd been a good but not outstanding student who had learned the meanings of many words. She had not yet learned the meaning of the word intermittent. She looked down again at the map to make sure the lake was really supposed to be there. It was. Without lifting her eyes from the map, she stuck out her hand. Lemon, please, she said. Her mother leaned over and dropped a lemon into the girl's palm. The girl stood up and opened the window and tossed the lemon out into the desert. It soared through the air and hit a gnarled trunk of a blackened sage as the White House grew smaller and smaller in the distance. The girl had once been a star pitcher of a softball team, and she knew how to throw. Don't lose that arm, her mother said under her breath. I wasn't planning on it, said the girl. She put the map away in the suitcase and beneath her seat and sat down. An old woman walked by, swaying slightly from side to side, and the girl smelled something damp and musty that reminded her of rotting leaves. It was the smell of old, fine, excuse me, it was the smell of fine old silk. The girl took a deep breath and closed her eyes, but she could not get comfortable. The seats were hard and stiff, and she had not slept since they had left California the night before. The girl had always lived in California, first in Berkeley, in a white stucco house on a wide street not far from the sea, and then, for the last four and a half months, in the assembly center at the Tan Foran racetrack south of San Francisco. But now she was going to Utah to live in the desert. The train was old and slow and had not been used in years. Broken gas lamps hung from the walls and the locomotive was fueled by a coal-burning boiler. Some of the passengers were sick from the uneven rocking of the cars and the crowded compartments smelled of vomit and sweat and very faintly of oranges. The soldiers had left a crate full of lemons and oranges on the floor of the car earlier that morning. The girl loved oranges. She had not eaten a fresh orange in months. She could not think of eating one now. The train lurched forward and she leaned over and put her head between her knees. I think I'm going to throw up, she said. Her mother gave her a brown paper bag and the girl opened it up and began to heave. Her brother reached into the pocket of his trousers and gave her a tissue. She crumpled it in her fist as her mother slowly rubbed her back. Don't touch me, said the girl. I want to be sick by myself. That's impossible, said her mother. She continued to rub her back, and the girl did not push her away. Toward noon, the train passed through a town south of Winnemucca. The shadows fell close to the buildings, and the sky above was bright and clear. 
the girl saw a large sign on the side of a water tower that said, Buy U.S. War Bonds Every Payday. She saw the advertisements for Old Shenley Whiskey in the American Medley Hour. They were still in Nevada, and it was still Sunday. Somewhere in the distance, church bells were ringing, and the streets were filled with people in their Sunday clothes walking home from the morning service. Three young girls in white dresses whirled by beneath matching white parasols. A boy in a blue suit pulled a slingshot out of his jacket and took careful aim at three blackbirds up high on a wire. <clears throat> Closer to the edge of town, a man and a woman were riding their bicycles across a bridge, and the girl wondered if they were together or if they just happened to be on the bridge at the same time. The woman wore dark sunglasses and short yellow pants and sh that showed her ankles, and she did not look like she had been to church. She was laughing, and her hair was loose and red and blowing behind her in the wind. The girl leaned out the window and shouted, Hey! But the woman did not hear her. She was too far away. She was coasting down the far side of the bridge, and the man was pedaling right behind her. The train blew its whistle, and the girl felt a hand pressed down on her shoulder. She pulled her head back into the car and looked up into the face of a soldier. He was a young man with light brown hair that bristled out from under the edge of his cap. Beneath his right eye there was a dark mole, and she could not stop staring at it. Then she looked at his eyes, and she could not stop staring at them, either. The soldier had very nice eyes. They were dark green, and looked right at her. Miss, he said, shades down, shades down. His voice was soft and low, and he did not smile, but she knew that he would if he could. She did not know how she knew this, but she did. Yes, sir, she said. She pulled down the shade, and the man and the woman and the bridge were gone. They were together, she decided. As the soldier made his way down the aisle, calling out, Shades down, shades down, in his deep, melodic bass, she chimed in with him softly under her breath, and then, in a voice that was not soft at all, she called out, Sir! She had not meant to call out, Sir, but the word had come out anyway. Sir! She said again. She could not help herself. Sir, sir, sir. The soldier did not hear her. As she leaned back in her seat, the old man in front of her turned around and said something to her in Japanese. His face was deeply tanned and his neck was thick with wrinkles from many years in the sun. One of his hands was missing two fingers. The girl shook her head and said she was sorry. She only spoke in English. So, 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 said the man. He turned away and pulled down the shade and the car grew a little darker. When the soldier reached the end of the car, he touched the gun on his hip lightly with his right hand to make sure it was still there, and she thought of how he had touched her shoulder the same way, lightly, and with that same hand, and she hoped he would come back again. Then the last shade went down and the darkness was complete, and she could not see the soldier at all. Now she could not see anyone at all, and no one outside the train could see her. There were the people inside the train and the people outside the train and in between there were the shades. A man walking alongside the tracks would just see a train with black windows passing by in the middle of the day. He would think, there goes the train, and then he would not think about the train again. He would think about other things, what was for supper maybe, or who was winning the war. She knew it was better this way. The last time they had passed through a city with the shades up, Someone had thrown a rock through one of the windows. The train slowed and crossed a wooden trestle over the dry bed of a river, and then there were no more towns by the tracks. There was only the highway, and it was all right to raise up the shades. The girl pulled on the string at the bottom of the shade, and the car flooded with sun. Do you think we'll see horses? her brother asked her. I don't know, said the girl. Then she remembered the Mustang she'd read about in National Geographic. The Spaniards had brought them over hundreds of years ago, and now there were thousands of horses just roaming around wild. Every autumn they came down from the hills to graze on the high desert plains. If a cowboy needed a new horse, all he had to do was go out into the desert and get himself one. It was as simple as that. She imagined a cowboy snapping his fingers and a horse, a wild white stallion, galloping up to him in a cloud of hot swirling dust. So she told the boy that they probably would. They probably would see some horses, because there were more wild horses in Nevada than in any other state. She'd read that in the National Geographic, too. 
How many do you think we'll see? Quite possibly eight. The boy seemed satisfied with this answer. He laid his head down on his sister's lap and drifted off to sleep. The girl was still too exhausted to sleep. She leaned against the window and tried to remember when her brother had first started talking about the horses. It had begun, she was almost sure of it, at Tanforan. All summer long they had lived in the old what? in the old horse stalls in the stables behind the racetrack. In the morning they had washed their faces in the long tin troughs, and at night they had slept on mattresses stuffed with straw. Twice a day when the siren blew, they had returned to the stalls for the head count, and three times a day they had lined up to eat in the mess hall on the ground floor of the grandstands. On their first night there, her brother had plucked the stiff horse hairs out of the freshly whitewashed walls and run his fingers along the tooth marks on the top of the double dutch door where the wood was soft and warm. On warm days he had smelled the smell of the horses rising up through the damp linoleum floors and on rainy days when she had stayed inside writing letters to her father in Fort Sam Houston or Lordsburg or wherever it was that he happened uh, to be her brother had gone out in his raincoat and his red rubber boots and walked around and around the muddy racetrack. One night, when the flies were very bad and they could not sleep, he had sat up suddenly in his cot and told her that when he grew up, he wanted to be a jockey. The boy had never been on a horse before in his life. A jockey is a small man, she had said to him. Do you want to grow up to be a small man? He could not make up his mind. Did he want to ride horses? He did. Did he want to be a small man? He did not. Ride horses, Mr. Okamura had shouted from the stall on the other side of the partition, Eat lots! Grow up to be big American boy! shouted Mr. Ito from two stalls down. The next day the carpenters had come and nailed wire mesh over the windows, and after that the flies were never so bad, and for a long time the boy did not talk to her about horses or anything else late at night. He just slept. Oh, give me land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me in.